Thanks, everyone, for um, coming today in your lunchtime to hear Patrick talk. He's a man that needs no introduction, really, so I won't um, say much apart from a really big thank you. Thanks for showing the work of the ZH Code Department upstairs, which has really, um, I think, activated the space. We've had so many people coming in looking at projects that haven't been shown before. Um, Patrick's always been such a brilliant proponent, I think, of experimentation in architecture, both in practice and in academia, setting up the DRL Design Research Laboratory at the AA over 20 years ago, and following up that kind of um, passion for experimentation, pushing the boundaries of practice, as I said, academia, and debate. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here at the Building Centre. Huge thank you, and we'll start. Thanks, thanks for Vanessa for inviting me. I always enjoy it platform and so I will talk about maybe 35, 40 minutes, maybe 45 and then we can uh, have a Q&A maybe with Vanessa or with mm -hmm. anybody. <laughs> so to be curious about the feedback, this partly overlaps with the show but it's not uh, just a replication, it's, it's a more ambitious um, trajectory of, of a talk. So I'm talking about tectonism which is a f uh, what I, a phrase I came up with to mark the latest developments in contemporary architecture under the umbrella of parametricism. And the work of the code team up there is contributing to this particular style, which is that it's, a, uh, it's marked by a particular methodology and uh, a much more coherent and sophisticated integration of engineering and fabrication logics into the morphologies. Ultimate drivers, of course, remain uh, social functionality concerns. Uh, but then subsidiary um, um, drivers are in the engineering logics. And there's a congeniality, I believe, with respect to the contemporary engineering sophistications using uh, computational methods uh, and the variability that affords optimization in the face of variability. And that is also this variability concern is obviously the concern of parametrism all along to adapt buildings into complex contexts and make them wrap around and, and, and facilitate very complex and integrate internal ongoings in buildings. So, so there's a congeniality and, and tectonism is, as I said, the latest stage of parametricism. So, and you can see that it looks quite rich. It looks, uh, tectonism is uh, like nearly like the endless forms of nature in terms of morphologies, much more diverse than what we've been used to from parametricism, which primarily nerve surfaces and usually um, relatively unarticulated. And here we're talking about um, curvilinear geometries, but they're, they're, they're much more particular with respect to certain uh, structural logics, material logics, and, 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 and um, tectonic fabrication logics. And you see also there's a much more internal articulation in them, and that is something which is, becomes important when we want to make architecture speak about what's going on, so this becomes a vocabulary of articulation, part of what I call the semiological project. So it's much more rich vocabulary to express the various different ongoings in, in the city than with parametrism or any prior uh, set of repertoires, which if you go back more in history, they become ever more kind of restricted and bland comparatively. So here you see some, one of the elements upstairs. Uh, 3D printing is only one of many new technologies, robotics-based, algorithmically driven. And the kind of generation of these outputs is in a simulated prior and we, through the de design tools which are con conscious in order to come of, of output potentials. And what we like about this, in fact, is for instance, with the printing, the, the tool path becomes a, an ornamental feature, a characterizing feature, but ornament isn't just making beautiful ornament, it's telling you what's uh, distinguishing one artifact of space from another. So that's the definition of tectonism. Um, it is a design philosophy, a style, so we're not talking about raw uh, engineering pragmatics, but using that as, a, as an input into some kind of heightened artistic project, and I put artistic in, it, in, in inverted commas, because that artistic articulation is in the end has purposes of its own, namely communication purposes, to, to clarify what the built environment is offering uh, through what I call the compositional stance that always has to be put on top of uh, let's say, the, 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 the physical engineering pragmatics. So, and this has been going on for quite some time, I'll say at least 10 years, and uh, it's, it's ready like all, uh, let's say, um, 
coinage of phrases about stylistic ongoings, I think should be partly retrospective, not just a kind of hope or promise of prospective intentions, but this is really something which exists already. And uh, so in terms of the theory of styles, um, styles are a set of values, uh, also sort of methodologies, and also they come with a, con with a, con with, with a, uh, with a particular understanding of the tasks of the design discipline that's concerned. And these operate not only in architecture, but across design disciplines. And I call them design programs. And I'm saying that there can be no rational design process without an underlying or exp explicit or implicit style. Everybody who's working on design has some kind of set of priorities, methods, values, whether made explicit or not, uh, it isn't inevitable. Uh, you can't make one design decision uh, out of one kind of idiom and methodology and then kind of drastically shift. Uh, and, 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 and So there's always a kind of, kind of strained universe of design and we just made to make explicit and that deserves the concept of style. And in terms of parametrism is very, very open and broad uh, set of principles that come to that. And so architecture is an academic discipline. So you're talking about experimentation and innovation. That's, that's key. Otherwise, we don't need an academic discipline, research, these claims, schools of architecture, uh, which are not just training, which are advancing the discipline. So that's very, very important. That's the way I see architecture versus building as an innovation. And in particular, the avant-garde um, is a subsidiary branch in the discipline. Um, and we look at styles here, which are not yet fully disseminated, for instance, like tectonism. It's, they're, they're, I show you some examples, some larger projects, but it's still a kind of drop in the ocean. So there's, we still, as there become design research programs. And uh, so, so a style always, and that's very important, has a set of formal and a set of functional heuristics. Not only about formal. Formal is more obvious. Uh, the principles, you, the, the repertoires you use, the values you apply to it, but there's also some kind of functional heuristic which, which guides the interpretation of the brief. So a modernist, for instance, a modernism has a very different understanding of a, a brief and the societal task of architecture than a 19th century historicist. And the same would be then the postmodernist has, again, a very, very different understanding, and so on, the deconstructive and parametricist. So we need to take that into account. Uh, so that we understand that style isn't something superficial, which is only to do with, with appearances. But then again, appearances should never be dismissed as just appearances, because appearances is what we need as users to guide ourselves through the built environment. So appearances are non-trivial, not to be dismissed. Uh, they are essential, and that we continuously invest in them as architects means something. Shouldn't dismiss that. So, but um, in terms of my theory of styles, I'm making the claim that parametrism is epochal, so it's something very broad, a broad house of everything contemporary which uses sophistication of computational tools in ways which increase complexity and adaptivity and variability in the built environment. You can also use some tools to sort of reproduce uh, what has been done, uh, what could be done without computers. That's not, but that's it. it's very, very broad. It's the epochal style, and then um, there's also the concept of well, subsidiary styles. So, like modernism used to have uh, white modernism, functionalism, rationalism, uh, brutalism, uh, metabolism, etc., etc. So, we should also expect that with parametricism, there is a series of subsidiary styles. And I, I've started to define those. But to go back to epochal styles, epochal styles are uh, the big head headlines by which we, 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 we mark centuries nearly of, of design. Uh, and they need, there needs to be a reason, there, a reason why we should switch style. Uh, by the way, I don't consider um, medieval architectures, actually not Romanic, the Rom Romanes, for instance, as a proper architectural discourse because they're, they're just bad versions of, of misunderstood Roman architecture. They're kind of vernaculars. The Gothic is the first sophisticated architectural project, but there's no architects, there's no treatises, no theoretical discourse, no discipline as such. Separated out, there's a transition. So architectural history, architecture proper, starts with the Renaissance, and these are the big headlines. And the point here is to align them with socioeconomic epochs. And only a, a transformation in the DNA of society and its processes and players merits 
a new style and also imprint itself on settlement patterns and a new kind of way of, 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 of uh, spatializing these different societies. And that's what styles should align to on that level of, of epochal style. So, in, and we're living really in a different era in terms of what I call post fortress network society. Uh, the transformation which happens throughout the 70s and 80s particularly. You can see it's also in the political domain. We're moving away from this kind of social democracy, planned uh, condition into neoliberalism and much more market-driven societies and so on. So this shows up on many levels, but it shows also in architecture. That the modernist architecture of mass mechanical reproduction, which you can plan and lay out the whole kind of blueprinted uh, uh, satellite city and kind of uh, mass fabricated from one hand, that's a bygone era, clearly. So uh, this style makes no sense anymore in a contemporary condition. And um, so I want to hint at this so that there's th these epochal styles have subsidiary styles. And um, later on, we'll come to a series of subsidiary styles for parameticism. There's also transitions when you have a big epochal shift. For instance, from historicism to, to modernism, we went through Art Nouveau and Expressionism, for instance. But when the 20s arrived, and um, uh, with the works of Corbusier, Mies, and Gropius, and the Bauhaus, that wiped out all these Art Nouveau and Expressionist kind of fanciful uh, experiments. And we had something moving strongly. And similarly, I would argue here, postmodernism and deconstructivism were attempts to cope with the new level of complexity in, in societal processes. And, comp and then the kind of my hope <laughs> and my proposition is that parametrism kind of uh, clears that out and leaves these behind, and then everything is on to parametricism. It's not quite what happened, but uh, it's certainly much stronger now, parametricism. It lasts already 25 years, whereas these had 10 years each, and there's lots of powerful large projects where, where, which you don't have in deconstructors, for instance. So this is where I, I started to look at uh, parametricism is already 25 years in the making and has spawned already a series of subsidiary styles. So. I could just, I'm using mostly uh, images from Zadid architects, but of course it's a broad um, uh, movement uh, which has many, many contributors. And maybe Zadid architects is the most prominent and largest, but also large commercial firms are partly contributing to this, as well as lots of, lots of smaller and boutique firms. So, and we've generated a series of large projects around the world uh, 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 which merit this. Uh, stands that this could be viable um, uh, on, a, on a much larger scale still. And um, so, so it just show this is a very old uh, sketch. Instead of drawing uh, all the retro styles which are still on vogue, like neo-rationalism, which is filling up London at the moment, you can actually draw with your, with your ruler and, 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 and you don't need sophisticated programs to run this. And we're talking here about throwing away kind of ruler and triangle and circle and, and having algorithms congeal much more complex and intricate geometries which, which incorporate multiple constraints. And I said later in tautonism terms, a lot of interesting sophisticated engineering constraints. So this radical shift from this set of, set of uh, ideal platonic figures and architecture used to be composing a handful of those, never more than three to five. Uh, and that was all of classical architecture, historical architecture, as well as modernism. This is Corbusier's diagram. He said architecture could be made of these kind of prismatic f volumes. And what we have instead is a totally new ontology, very, very different repertoires with, with um, much more um, uh, versatility, let's say. So, so th this is the uh, principles. We have to kind of give up these rigid forms. Simple repetition, mass reproduction is over, and just collaging unrelated elements. That's what's happening actually now in terms of uh, after the breakdown of modernism, spontaneously, there's no actually urbanistic imprinting of any leadership from the discipline side. There's just stuff happening. That is also rejected. But this collage, uh, which is rejected, was actually the principle of deconstructism, for instance. They just, they just heightened that into an aesthetic principle. Uh, positively, we want to vary so that we have intelligent adaptation of forms to conditions and to each other. The systems where we have multiple elements congregated into systems, they are always differentiated rather than rep repetitive. And the systems need to be correlated, they need to be interacting, need to recognize each other and add up to something. So, and the intensity of relations is what we're looking for. 
internally within buildings, within the various spaces, they all communicate with each other, aware of each other, so they add up to an integrated uh, system, and also the building itself plugs into a system into fabric of connections. So it's, in, you know, in, a, in the mid 20th century, you had this kind of ability to isolate various operations, and they were just integrated through a plan, and you didn't have to have lateral communication. Now we have to have lateral communication galore, as it were. And um, so, so, so what we can do, we, we, we take systems, we differentiate them, so the, the, and we can also adapt to conditions and make continuous with existing conditions. We don't believe in this kind of collaging of one against the other, but weaving and stitching things together and then have internal differentiations and logics. Um, so, so, but this is important that, that these formal principles that tie up with functional heuristics. So we don't like, for instance, these fixed stereotypes, which make it possible to have typologies so rolled out anymore, because they not make, that's not the way society works anymore. Every firm, every school, every, every uh, new organization is unique and different. Uh, we don't have this kind of social homogenization of a mass condition, where everybody has the same minimum standards. Uh, and we don't like the segregative zoning, as I said. So, so, so these formal principles make a lot of sense with respect to and positively, we like, as I said, we like um, all functions are parametrically variable event scenarios. So it's not just, you know, you know what a, um, conference center is like with three auditoriums or something like this. So they, they, need, to, they need to be uniquely crafted or what, 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 uh, uh, what an exhibition opening is. It could be many, many different things in the contemporary world. So everything becomes uh, the, um, um, variable and, and, and adaptive. Uh, the program domains are, you know, if you have a university with, 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 with seminar rooms, they should be not hundred the same, but they should be all different. So you have choice and variation and exploration. And then, as I said, everything communicates with everything else. So, and look, some of this, where this started, I think this might or might not work. Okay, it doesn't. Uh, the video is done. Um, so this started, uh, foldism was the first um, version of thermatism, which started in the early 90s and mid-90s. And that was the idea that instead of having different items aggregated, you have something which continuously differentiates, evolves, splits, undulates, and so on. And, and you get something which is where, where the different zones bleed into, blend into each other, and you have more an explorative freedom to, to, to read and use these spaces. And uh, so, so, so we did a lot of sketches like DRL, like this, urbanism. So these kind of open, fluid surface, everything molded out of a, sur of a surface. And that you have also, instead of five, four different identical stations, you have adapted, varied kind of genotype, phenotype relationships of, of, of these stations adapting to different conditions. But having an, an underlying, let's say, unified DNA. Uh, so this idea of continuous, modulated mo surfaces where one condition also morphs into another. This, this allows you all the kind of in-between and transitioning. This is something kind of radically new, ra unheard of, uh, a kind of monumental expansion of, category expansion of, of the repertoire of space making. And before you had to kind of predefine a series of types and set them next to each other. And here you have something which continuously evolves and blends into each other, continuously changing and roaming and moving. And this, this, this used for, for interiors, for furnishings, for everything. Um, and you can also affiliate and make something which has many different parts much more unified uh, so that, that these balconies are similar to lighting gantries, for instance, or to um, think. And so, so this foldism uh, stage uh, this mostly nerve surfaces, I think blending one to the other, there's a continuous flow of spaces, is still going on, by the way. We're still completing projects which were designed like this 10 years ago. So there's, there's a long life, it's not necessarily over, but uh, tectonism is something superior and beyond that. Uh, but I'm still gonna show you, this. So, so it's this feature of making, instead of cluttering things up with the staircase, a set of lights, uh, uh, these things blend and bleed into each other and, and, and uh, collaborating, creating a complex space, making a complex space legible to avoid visual cluttering and have the essential space flowing and have everything element, technical element, subsidiary to this. 
Um, and that is a kind of compositional stance, stance a formal artistic operation. But, but the meaning of this is to, to make legible and orient people. Um, that's under the heading of foldism, the compositional stance. But this compositional stance or formal artistic stance is also coming in later under the, under the heading of tectonism. Here you can see again the, the use of the way the staircases are worked into the overall tectonics of, 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 of an auditorium. So the latest of these on a larger scale with multiple buildings embedded into this landscape, you see that there's a kind of action-reaction where, where, where the museum hits, the landscape makes space, and there's ripple effects which lead you back to the museum, articulates the entrance. So this is all a, a, a kind of quasi-organic organic, um, uh, compositional techniques which make things, I believe, uh, harmonious and legible. And that's um, something kind of under the auspices of foldism, uh, which we're just completing now. But well, these projects take a few years. <laughs> and also, the, the tectonism research is something which, which is more ambitious, and we're still in the kind of research phase, and we haven't executed maybe on that scale yet. But we're getting there. So, so this is a kind of more elaborate and, and larger version of the kind of foldism we, we saw maybe in, in projects like Baku. This is in Changcha in China. Because there's three buildings, there's also a museum complex. And you can see here ideas like porosity and openness, continuous flow of space, elevators. You don't disappear into a core, but you have panoramic elevators, features we, we used to. There's some kind of detail of this. How do you mediate between a, in this shifted section in a building without making this building fall apart? Uh, these kind of details are also kind of folding details. And um, even this twisted tower. The meaning of this is that you that you that you uh, have a gesture which which connects the tower and, and and bends it over and connects it up with the, with the podium condition, which is also then perceived on the inside. And and so you, so some of these moves seem willful, but they're also orienting on the ground differently from the and, and the top actually I don't have this image. The top axis is exactly aligned with an axis of a street and then it twists the rudder to, to make a move with the ground condition. Or, or even this one is, is, is the idea of opening up these towers of continuous movement and connection, visual connection throughout, rather than having everything sliced up and separated by a, maybe a, and blocked by a core during this building in China. So this is an internal atrium, uh, which also connects with a big window to the, to, the, to the urban fabric, to the neighboring buildings. And this is happening right now. So foldism is still going on. The latest one we're opening at the end of the year uh, is, is a kind of landscape uh, plaza condition where there's a continuous surface ramping, peeling, moving around an, an old historic building in, in Cyprus. So it's kind of fluid flow of, of a landscape-like condition, integrating traffic, landscape, um, old buildings, etc. So... The next one is nearly the similar. It's nearly they're, they're fused into each other, but what's the next stage was the work with blobs. And the idea here is that, okay, you have closed volumes. It's not only everything is opening and flowing, but you, these, these volumes aren't discrete and separate. They bleed into each other. They affect each other. They, 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 they um, for, uh, form these kind of ambiguous clusters, let's say. And so you have a bit more definition of one zone and another, but they, they flow and bleed into each other. And um, research projects, real projects, um, it's also you know, motivated by certain tools, like metabol tools or nerve servers and so on. They, they come in as, like before architecture was also determined by the ruler and by the compass, we're not getting away from this, but we have more vers versatile tools now, which imprint. Uh, and that generates new ideas. For instance, that you can have these spaces semi-articulate with degrees of articulation. And you have something which is very kind of uh, embedded in a complex, like an amoeba, in a complex irregular site with different levels. So you can slip underneath and through, underground and on top and into it and so on. So this is something that is very, very context-sensitive embedded. And it's at the same time its own kind of strong character or even um, residential kind of blob-like 
blister-like spaces. And they're, they articulate quite well. The, the convex, concave distinction have a strong identity, where, which space you can make complexity legible. If it was all rectilinear, you would, you would become, fall apart into kaleidoscope. This is a big project. You see how kind of radical it pops out in a normal fabric. And um, at the moment, but when parametrism takes over, this is kind of a continuous text, urban texture like this, but with more diversity, with more richness. Uh, this is the building in, in Beijing you might have seen. But the important thing is like this, where you have simultaneity of multiple, uh, many, many different offers in view all the time, always opening up the section and, 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 and then using the logic of convex, concave to, to guide you and dif distinguish where you are and have things blend into each other. So this is the latest idea of a mega atrium uh, we're working on. Um, um, okay, so swarmism, the next thing came up, I'm just this once, uh, you saw it earlier, yeah, um, that particularly in urbanism, but also with, with, with elements on facades or with furniture, uh, so you can use discrete pieces instead of making a grid like this, which is good for tight packing and, and good for simple events like this, where there's one speaker and a group of listeners and nothing else going on for the next, next hour. But if you, had, if you look at bureau landschafts, you have kind of swarms of furniture which bleed into each other. Then we're getting into, into, into this kind of swarmism condition also when you have uh, facades, elements, you kind of roam around on the facade. There should maybe reorient and be different each time there's a different sun exposure, different condition on the inside. So, so this kind of idea of swarms of things uh, it's been quite powerful, and the tools for that initially was uh, generative components, where you can kind of have these components and you kind of populate surfaces, and and you have an algorithm which distinguishes and differentiates locally the component relative to conditions which hit it. So oftentimes tool driven, and they become kind of styles nearly, and and that's when we f when I first came up with the phrase parametrism. Most people associate to this kind of techniques which I now call uh, swarmism, as it were. And uh, so if you look that up, they kind of nearly could also be summarized into one subsidiary stage, but you can also distinguish them. They're, they're sequenced like this, overlap. They're still ongoing to some extent. It's not over. But I think tectonism is something pretty radically new, almost far more sophisticated. And you can see here in terms of foldism and these nerve surfaces, you, get, you always get this kind of similar geometries and uh, usually kind of um, rendered or fiberglass, continuous surfaces. There isn't much else. Uh, you can put the pattern on it, but nothing comes inherent out of the logic. So, so uh, there's also other subsidiary styles we'll not talk about. One could start talking about discretism and virtualism as, as other ongoing things which which, which are ongoing out there in the, in the computational uh, movements, which I think are kind of there, but less potent. But um, I've recently uh, commented on object-oriented architecture. Something is going on in SIARC. It's interesting. Uh, it's not the topic of this. I just wanted to mention that there is other contenders for this place, which is the kind of cutting edge of parametricism, of con that means of contemporary architecture, tectonism. So um, again, going through where this, where this leads to, tectonism is the, is the frontier. I had this image already. So the idea here is tectonics has always been uh, there, which means you, uh, you, you somehow the building reveals how it is made out of parts, materiality becomes present. And it has also been the case that these um, premises or inputs from fabrication and engineering were kind of artistically heightened. So they become kind of an ornamental. Maybe there was a compositional stance from the architect, you see, because this rustication is artificial. There's an, a willingness and intent to make the um, make the joints very, very visible. You kind of groove them in, which actually takes strengths away from the wall. So they kind of, you want to express strengths and big stones. And that expressive effort, in fact, weakens the actual wall. So you see there's a kind of 
there's, we have to reckon with this, and, but I subscribe to this because in the end that articulates that zone of the villa as the rusticated um, 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 uh, zone where the workshops are and where the servants live and so on, and on top was the, the Piano Nobile, and then on top of that was the polished private quarters. So there's a kind of semiology attaches to this. Um, so we have, in terms of the input, structural rationality, environmental rationality, we'll talk about this as well, and fabrication rationality. And again, you have that same, the, the, this is an old phenomenon, the Gothic is very, very strong at this, that you, you have this kind of, the way these, these walls were created, the, the, the form of the world itself isn't, becomes characteristic, and then is also, of course, a made a feature and a theme artistically heightened into something recognizable. And then you have also different versions of this. Um, so you see there's an artistic kind of overcoding, and I subscribe to this. And so you can make your space particular and characteristic. But also what they all share, you know these are church spaces because that's, uh, that's um, um, dematerialization has is, is only been done for, for these very prominent spaces. So we're looking at that. And we look, this was a DRL project uh, by Maria Zironi. So, so, so to learn from this, this feeds directly into, into, into uh, tectonism. Um, so the idea here is that the, that beauty of the interior maybe should also be expressed on the outside. Of course, we're moving from, from pointed arches to paraboloid arches, more optimized structures. And we, instead of having one uh, space repeated, like in that nave, uh, we have a continuous variation of these. And we are also working on the profiling, the profiling changes, it's compression and tension, so it's a kind of a hyper-sophisticated parameterism gothic, uh, which, can, which can then distinguish multiple uh, interesting spaces and so on. And have asymmetries and, and a lot of things going on there. And so we, we you looked also at Gaudi, and we, 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 at DRL, we, what feeds into this is just experimenting with materials. I mean, that, that Gaudi chain model or Fire Otto um, um, uh, set of models he's created feeding directly into this, into form finding processes which are materially and, and structurally driven, gravity driven, structural optimization driven. So we have endless number of, um, of studies playing around with tensile structures to home in on morphologies. Then the attempt is to be made, obviously, to gain hold of this and reproduce some of this digitally. And that's always a big step and difficulty. There's abstractions and reductions there. But still, in order to work with in contemporary, you can't literally design with physical models. Uh, that's unviable. But, so, but that's a, a, it's a stage of this kind of tectonism uh, idiom and style to go through this, potentially, and then uh, try to develop algorithms or find algorithms out of all sorts of contexts of the sciences and, and engineering logics and appropriate them for a kind of design philosophy, the kind of um, the logic of sand uh, cones bleeding into each other, intellect, etc., etc. So there's tons of this. And when I published Parametrism 2.0, didn't come up with the phrase technologism yet, but, but I was selecting the most advanced colleagues in the movement and looking back, they're all under the heading of technologism, whether it's Mark Fawns, whether it's Achim Menges, whether it's um, our code team, uh, Mark Burry, um, Philip Block research team, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, there's a whole cluster of protagonists which are 100% within the technologism uh, paradigm. Uh, like Mark Burry, and, and then looking back and appropriating also precursors like Gaudi, Dieste, Fai Otto. Um, and then also like Philip Block looking back at compression only masonry stone structures, but then overcoming the limitation because the limitations here is these only work, these were equilibrium structures, we could only be done if you have symmetry. Well, it's nearly trivial that something symmetrically becomes equilibrated, but that you can do that with totally asymmetric. Um, structures, meaning you can take, like parametrism, any irregular site, and you have the freedom of not having to oppose a symmetry, which, which, which isn't coming from the brief or the site, but, but, but nevertheless having fully equilibrated compression structures, super, super efficient, 
uh, through an algorithmic coping uh, and, and, and optimization. That's, that's something which is then kind of unique because these are not nerve cells. These are very particular uh, compressions, geometries. And, and so we, we, the advantage here is you have the v v diversity of morphologies but also you have the downstream realizability, efficiency, and, and, and well, economical realizability, guaranteed because they're constraining from the very get-go. And uh, so we have a lot of new constraints, but since we have yet with these constraints enough degrees of freedom, we don't feel impotent or, or, or too, too constrained with this because we, all, we, we, we could also use concrete, we could use tensor, we could use all sorts of uh, techniques and we accept the constraints uh, when we're designing for the sake of A, downstream deliverability, but also there's a unique, beautiful characteristic in each of these, which makes them coherent. Whereas where you kind of fumble by, by yourself and, and pulling around vertices, you, 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 you don't get that. You get something uh, botched up, as it were. So and there's some beautiful, striking things like this kind of uh, reticulated shell which has, a, which has a tensile cable which holds all these elements in equilibrium. And if you cut this cable, this thing falls into a thousand pieces. And then, you know, but with the science, with the intelligence, you can go back and, and discover, uh, empirically discovered historical intelligences back for architecture. So the code group worked with Philip Block a lot and, and Shaje was the leader of the code group, is, is a PhD student of Philip. And of course, this also relies on the fact that you can then kind of, if there's a hundred and, uh, and, and uh, several hundred unique pieces which need to be kind of carved or molded or generated, the robotic fabrication is also important. So the other thing is structural uh, uh, engineering, um, for instance, structural tubes. And if the, if the tower starts to bend, not willfully, maybe to make space for, for a bridge or gesturing one tower to another to just that they belong together, there would be reasons for this. And then you want to put a, a structure on this. Uh, the kind of usual engineering recipes fall apart. You need algorithms to, to find that and, you, and, and make this possible. Um, but even for simple pieces, uh, the, the geometry of an optim, op, optimized load path is, isn't the grid, never. So, 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 so there is interest in using these new tools which show you kind of um, primary and secondary stress lines and then to use that directly to translate into reticulations. So we, we're doing this and we're applying this to high pass shells so you can over, you know, these shells existed in the 60s with, 70s with Candela, you now kind of can make them reticulated shells, sophisticated. And we did this with the, with the, with the grid shell, one of the code projects was to take uh, three, hype, um, three hypers of a Candela church, make them asymmetric, then turn them into uh, stress line optimized uh, grid shells, and then um, build them in, in layers where, 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 where the, the, the more harder working tubes zones get three layers, two layers versus one layer, like in this, and then you generate something which has actually uh, surprising beauty, like the constructions of nature, as it were, as well, usually, because there's logic and differentiation, and that makes them characteristic, recognizable, appealing intuitively, because you can trust and to get a sense of its performance and power. We also love tensile structures, and uh, we also, this also applies to furnishings. So it's a super light, 3D printed uh, chair, and there's a series of stages and steps where, where, where we create the, the rough outline of a chair, uh, make these surfaces, the surfaces kind of a shell-like uh, mesh relaxed, optimized, and then there's a superimposition of this technique of topology optimization where you reticulate them. And that's, these are beautiful techniques where, where, you, where we just by implying a surface and uh, load imprints and, and supports, it discovers iteratively of an optimized sort of load path. And then we take this uh, and interpret this, and that, that's again a kind of artistic interpretation. How do you interpret this? There's various ways. You extrude the rib, or in this case, we thin, thickening or thinning uh, the, uh, the print density, and also we increase or decrease the porosity. So there's a way we, we interpret that rib, and that's a, a dis, an artistic decision. Uh, you could, again, uh, once you decide this, you can, you can, you can look at various 
optimizations, but you can never optimize across a kind of t uh, the, the infinity of options. So there's always decisions where you start, for instance, where you start with the outline that you're using mesh relaxation, then that you're using topology optimization, et cetera, then how you interpret this, et cetera. So we're not getting away from, from, from um, uh, architectural decision making. But what I love about the chair is, 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 is that it's um, super light. And so we, we use the similar technique for, for this kind of pavilion. This is also the code group. So very similar thing, the, the shell optimized, then the reticulation, and then a translation which has a lot of geometry optimization to, to make this uh, straight line network of, of, of beams, and then a series of uh, rollable loops, et cetera. So this, this, has, this has a series of intelligent um, algorithmic processes superimposed to the end deliver something very organic and relatively rapid. This was not built already a number of times uh, and relatively um, um, cost effective. And then we have, um, um, we had this show, Meta Utopia, where we, we showed a lot of Bartlett and, and AA and, and office experiments in using 3D printing in various ways, uh, or robotic assembly conditions. So, and so, so we like the, um, and there are certain constraints built in this. You, you know, when the robot uh, builds these up, you can't kind of go out like this. There are certain constraints and you can move uh, the stability of the material, the, 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 the tool path, there's more where you kind of make them slower and faster, kind of little blisters. So it becomes ornament and desired. You, you can't get away from these traces, so the attitude is to make them, to let these characteristics come through and distinguish one object from another. And we kind of enjoy that. And as you see, the diversity of um, approaches and fabrication logics compared to, let's say, this earlier stage of parameterism where everything was, this is the earlier stage, where everything was fiberglass polished NURB surfaces, we're getting far more rich, and that in the end is important for making architecture speak and distinguishing the various players and spaces much more richly. So we had in parametrism, of course, you have a lot of formal variation, but we've reached a stage where we're kind of in danger of monotony, so tectonism comes in to overcome that put danger of monotony, which, which of course which comes in uh, with, with, with parameters much later than with minimalism, of course, but it still comes. So, uh, so we like, this is the latest kind of 3D printed uh, chair we did with a small startup company called um, uh, Nagami. Another one was AI build. Uh, actually, we love, we're working a lot of these sorts here as well with, 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 uh, with Audico and so on. With, with, with this space at the moment isn't the big industrial players, it's startup companies. Uh, which generate this. This is on also done by Audico. This is, I think, from upstairs as well. He's showing this. Uh, so to make uh, molds with polystyrene instead of milling, milling has been around for quite a long time, but it takes a, a lot of time. Uh, so this is about 20 or 30 times faster to generate a mold, and that makes makes a difference. And but also we like that instead of making uh, the usual nerve surface, we have this kind of interesting ruled surfaces. Everything is hot wire cut, and it gives the imprints a particular characteristic. So you can have many different of these benches or walls, and if they all follow that technique, then they all share a uniquely identifiable characteristic. So they, you can show and express that they belong together. And then there's another technique, there's another set of systems, and these things belong together. So you can have unity cross difference in each of these techniques. But I think you also have unity of cross difference across the whole universe to go back. There's something which they all share still, which is tectonism. But then each of these subsystems has its unique recognizability. So now we're going that how this, we want to apply this to big architecture as well. And one way to do it is to express the structure. And of course the structure has to, to become part of parametrism, can't be the usual structure that's just extruding the columns up, and you just change, put less rebar in it. 
so that this is any differentiation between bottom, middle, and top is invisible, or any way these columns are hidden, and you get this kind of neutral. So we like to have something which strongly impresses that something different goes on here, and it kind of becomes lighter and more filigree here, and you know in which zone you are. And there's also opportunities, like in this tower, you have the differentiation through the skeleton, you can have three apartments here, two here, and one per floor here, and you have different co balcony conditions, different product, and a variation on the inside, which, which nearly becomes, then harmonizes and should be congenial with the, with the, with the um, exterior. So here it's as well, we use the different zones of structure for different functions as well. So this one is a nice one, let's nearly finish it now, um, where we uh, develop this um, skeleton approach to, 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 to a tower. in Miami. So it becomes quite filigree at the top with only four columns. They're, they're split apart. Um, and you can see that, I want to show with these images and this one, this is not only a kind of, it's structurally sophisticated. These optimizations that deliver this freedom of openness, of, of, of open free corner, and we should let show later as well. There's a lot of things which compel uh, 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 like also the moment of modernism where you had suddenly that openness and it still pervades and now on a much larger scale. So this is not only uh, legibility, variation, uh, uh, optimization materially, but also experientially, I think, striking, striking moments you generate. Uh, so this is that, that thing under construction. It's a new construction technique actually where we pre-molded all these elements, uh, but they're not cladding. They are part of the structure, and they be, there's a kind of lost formwork. Prefabricated formwork pieces come together and then filled with concrete, and you build up a, a strong uh, skeleton. You see it's quite thin. And so we did at the DRL um, sometimes kind of skeleton research. So <laughs> just putting this next to each other. So this is a kind of a modernism. And using topology optimization uh, to generate an interesting skeleton, with a lot of these <coughs> void conditions on the inside. So you have a series of primary uh, uh, decks, sky decks, which are where the load comes in and then accumulates in the topology of and finds kind of, some kind of structural path to connect all these. It also cantilevers out, etc. So, so this is something where um, we are using tools, this is just this is not quantifiable yet, it's not en fully engineered, but give you a, the relative distribution of structural lines and material give you something quite organic and beautiful. Um, so that's design research at the AA. Um, and this is uh, the building we recently finished. You, you might have saw, you saw some of this, which is, which is the exoskeleton, which is more, it's not uh, form fine, it's, 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 it's it's optimized uh, partly only. We only had defined three zones, bottom zone, middle zone, and top zone uh, in terms of the, the way the, the skeleton shifts. And, and then we, um, we worked this through on, with this spectacular interior view. I'll show you that in a minute. What, what this delivers is an, an incredible sense of freedom on the inside. So there's done with my little camera, when you, when, you, when you take the panoramic elevator on the inside, you get quite a, um, an experience there with, with multiple these public spaces and bridges um, um, connecting these two banks of panoramic elevators. And this is all the way through the tower. And you get this kind of also interesting connection with the exterior spaces. So the, our atriums are not always purely interiors. They're, we always have these windows and connections to the outside. And this is where you, where you step in at the bottom, then you look up, and some of my snapshots going up through this thing. And you get also, you know, in, when in the room you know which building you are in, and you get, um, you also design some of these interior spaces. You can see that these bridges and, and the void and the, all the banks of uh, panoramic elevators. And then the, 
the more normal rooms, but again, we have here, you see later, opportunities for, 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 for open corners, like this, so that's the room. With the, with, the, with the pool, or at the top, you get another condition with, with the swimming pool. Okay, so um, another one of those is shell structure, so something which, which is semi-traditional, so there's also a notion of a permatic regionalism where you go into Middle East or we go to China, we sometimes use motifs or features, but also you can import some of the intelligence climate-wise and material-wise, but so these domes, are, but they're still high-performance concrete shells, so they're, 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 they're paraboloid arches. And what you see here, so you, when you work on these and you optimize the reticulation, then you can have various ways, again, there's the artistic choice in inverted commas, of characterizing them through extruded ribs, more or less dense, um, as pleats, opportunities for, for, for openings. So, so this is the stage where the, where the engineering moves into com composition and space making and, and semiology, because later you'll see that we have to distinguish with all these shells of different sizes, but we need to, again, we need to worry it becomes monotonous. Shell, 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 where are you? So we need to use all these different ways of techniques of making them. The larger ones have deeper ribs, have perforations, etc. To so that you can, that you can distinguish and characterize the different spaces and not do that arbitrarily by making one blue, one green, one yellow, uh, but inherently by using different tectonic systems. So the semiology project is tied in very, very strongly with the tectonism project, where we use as a repertoire of articulation not something invented arbitrarily, but something which comes out of uh, structural optimization materiality, fabrication, logics, tool paths, and so on. The, 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 these ornamental features, and ornament is always, let's say, semiological communication, comes out of the tectonism. So that's part of the tectonism. So tectonism can't be reduced to an engineering project. It's an architectural style using this for the, for the purpose of semiology. You can see here there's a lot of ornateness and characteristicness in these, so that these different halls are different. And... Um, uh, and that we can do that. The exterior make them more uniform. There's something else going on where to distinguish courtyards and primary on spaces on axes and so on. You can see um, a lot of the themes and the, the, the power of being able to do this, having the algorithms and having the, the, the modeling capacity, means that, that we, we, we can compete with the most and richest historical architectures. And here there's partly a deliberate affiliation to those while being at the same time high tech. Um, that, that, that's possible and, and we can do that in a few months and not in a, in, in a hundred years, let's say. Um, okay, so, so, and I wanted to show, these are pro projects I did at the GSD with some students, Google Campus, and using different tectonic systems. This is the Frey Otto wool thread model which he, which he used for past patterns in, in, in settlement structures, but also use them for and can be used for load path patterns. And you get this. And you can see here quite quickly, although we have different sizes, different conditions, different colors, monotony sets in even with tectonism if you only work with one system. I mean, these are beautiful projects. This is project number two with grid shells. Project number three with catenaries. And I realized quite quickly, if you had to do something as huge as Google Campus for 12,000 people, each of these, even though there's lots of varieties, sizes, directions, etc., would become disorientally monotonous. So we need to, in a sense, have multiple systems. All these three systems maybe have to, have to collaborate to create something like this and make it uh, sufficiently varied, but in ways which aren't falling apart into a kind of uh, illegible collage either. So, so that's the kind of realization, that, and I want to show these here, uh, the different four pavilions, for instance, of Achimenges under the tectonism regime. So all of these four should be part of one project instead of making a project of, a whole project out of one of them. These four plus more need to come to bear if you make something a large, complex 
uh, project for the sake of orienting articulation, the various diverse department zones, uh, um, um, interaction atmospheres you want to generate. And you don't want to generate this by, by randomly graphic, uh, um, um, but by using like this. And what is beautiful here about, I think you can see here that they are similar through their materiality. These are, si uh, uh, and, and these are similar through their um, cellularity, and these are similar through their kind of linearity. So you get similarity and contrast in both directions. So that's kind of network of similitude and contrast is what drives the semiological project, and tectonism is a perfect feeder into this project. And the view of, uh, just a few more of our uh, techniques. So, for instance, we worked with curved folding. The advantage here is that you that you have you can have sheet materials and you get curvature and complexity, but you also get this characteristic unity across all these diverse elements, and that's what what, what we like. And of course, you need that. each of these. That's why it's not so easy that it's instantly disseminated. Playing around with Maya nerve surfaces, that was quickly disseminated. These will also disseminate as these tools get ready, but there's obviously more skill and understanding and more versatility to build them up first. Once they're all there, I think they can also uh, um, uh, be disseminated and, 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 and um, played with by our designers as well. But even in the office, you'll see we have a research team and we have a front of design team and the migration of these techniques and tools into a more generalized use is not something which is instant. So, um, This is one of the projects of the co team, which is curved folding. So it's a very characteristic thing. But it's beautiful. There's nearly this 1.5 millimeter uh, sheet material and robotically cut, scored, and, and, and bent to make these, these pieces. And then again, we, we don't mind these bolts. They become part of the inverted commas ornament, which is character this. And you see these are made out of different pieces. So this is also. Um, so we have structure, we have engineering, fabrication, and we have environmental. So in the imprinting of environmental conditions, like in this one, where you have structure, and shading is a strong, very, very strong uh, component. And you can see how the tower looks very different from different sides. And that's orienting. Instead of having that neutral glass box, so if you, if you, if you, if you allow sun exposure and directions and climatic condition to imprint on the building, then the building becomes also a signaling and much better landmark but it also gives character to this project. And this is the one which, which is also kind of driven by, by in its articulation by um, environmental parameter. So it's all courtyard based. So it's also a kind of quasi regionalism because it's in Saudi Arabia. And you have these kind of um, layers of light filter Caught a topology, but then we've tilted it because there's a primary wind direction and a sun direction, and it's also unusual. It's based on hexagons, and uh, very very solid on the outside, was very deep, and then we have these shading elements in the center, which are also on the hexagon, and you get something like this where you have, um, and then these things kind of stagger, and you get here a field. First of all, it's parametric in the sense that these hexagons aren't uniform, they kind of squeeze and expand, and smaller and larger. They all orient the courtyards towards uh, a receiving wind and taking out sun. And you can see that the similar parameters of wind and sun imprint on both the solid courtyard volumes and the shading elements. So you get here with the same set of parameters imprinting on very different things unifies those because they both respond to them. And that's another thing. We have unity across difference or difference uh, within the unified organization. So that these sh shading elements belong to this building uh, because they share features and though they be at the same time very different. So you, uh, and, and internally, of course, very different kind of spaces uh, underneath these shading elements. And, and so this is a project which has a lot of outdoor spaces. Um, and they're still viable because there's a lot of breathe and, and a lot of shading at the same time. And um, so, so that is our built examples of tectonism driven through environmental uh, logics, let's say. 
And, uh, and then again, but structure isn't been, been a theme here. And then you also have internal courtyards, which are similar to the courtyards or atriums, and they're then glazed over. But again, the direction of that glass is away from the sun, etc. And then also a um, characterizing different spaces differently. Uh, this is the uh, religious space, let's say, in this case. And this idea, and again, we, we have um, using structure. This was Tokyo shells, arches, tensile structures to give character to a building or the airport in Beijing. I just want to go through this. So we're using uh, primary structural elements, uh, long spans, uh, but also the elements themselves as, as, as giving rhythm and order and orientation to the, to the space. And I'll explain it in a minute because this is um, um, a big central orientation space, which is much more transparent, and then a series of huge uh, uh, structures, petal structures with one central column and th two other touchdown points leading you out to the gates. That's the basic structure, and these are very, very large um, um, spans, space structures, and column coinciding with light, and solid roofs versus transparent roof, orientation, central orientation zone, and then the path out to the gates, like this. So this is also, um, let's say, an orienting um, device, an articulation device, um, the core competency of architecture using space and form and detail to communicate where you are and where to go, as it were. So this is the basic diagram. See the front you come in, central orientation space, and these gaps uh, leading you out to the gate, and then a series of, um, in the center of these darker spaces, a huge column and um, light uh, well. And where we would like to go with this is um, to make more variation and to make a space which isn't just a grand big uh, space, but which is a series of subsidiary spaces. And this diagram brings it home for me that, and it's quite an old diagram, that, that with this kind of tectonic articulation is, uh, is the differentiation of zones and subzones by giving them different character. More light, less light, more density of, 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 of members, less density to members. And there should be, there should have to do with um, um, structural optimization because structural optimization run over a differentiated topography will generate these differences. And then the task would be to, as artistic task would be to heighten these and make them more coherent and different rather than here where you have uh, each element must be different and you have parametric tools under Foster's design to avoid these things looking different, to make it all neutral and similar, uh, but every cell is different and I want um, something which is actually understood in its difference and variation. So, but then again, the next stage would be uh, potentially to even more variation, but not and I think there's a harmony across these, not, uh, not to, to collapse into collage like now and kind of an undigested agglomeration, but a, a nature-like differentiation and using, using all these rationalities, which are, um, um, of course, always good arguments because if you work technically sufficient, you have less depth, you have less weight, you have less cost, you have, you're wasting less space for air con equipment and, and huge... Um, uh, let's say, uh, ceiling cavities, which you have to later on navigate across. So, so, so there's many good reasons, not only cost, uh, for, for good architecture to be as light-footed as possible. But I think, additionally, what I'm interested in, we should be in as an architect, is that, is that um, uh, legibility of something which, is, which becomes very intuitively navigable and oriented. You know where you are, where you're going, where you're moving. 
and you not have to kind of look at your at GPS all the time. Because <laughs> then you don't know, then you miss out on what's going on in between. And it also presupposes that you know where you're going, that maybe you just want to browse a world which, 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 is, which is, is incredibly legible, as it were. So um, with this, I want to uh, stop. This is another little project where we're trying to use some of these techniques for school. Um, and I just wanted to show that um, um, aesthetic sensibilities come with that. So there's something beautiful about these elements. We trust them. We can sense their performance. But we also have to watch out that there's which performance we mean, what we fall in love with. Maybe this is kind of no longer uh, credible. We, um, and, and so we need to, the deals of beauty shift. And we need to, we need to fall in love with the right kind of project. Thanks. I just want to say a massive thank you. <laughs> I, Monday lunchtimes have never been this exciting at the building centre. Oh yeah, overrun a bit, I realised. Yeah. No, we, well, I'm sure no one minds being late back for work. <laughs> I think what strikes me when I hear you talking about kind of the articulation of space is also the incredible kind of articulation that you have and the practice employs with language and sort of thinking and describing that very bold kind of innovative use of words and the way that words come together to make kind of new meanings is really important. Is that something, do you try and keep that going in the practice? Well, do I think you it's kind of yeah, it's important spend a lot of time talking? Or? It's very important. I mean, uh, first of all, to convince ourselves, to convince uh, co collaborators. Yeah. That are, I mean, there's an intuitive draw to this. But there's also a lot of enemies and, and detractors mm -hmm. and hostility. And, and so, which could confuse people. And so to, is, this is not meant to be eloquent, so it's not to be rhetorical. This is meant to be have reasons, good reasons, sound reasons, mm -hmm. why this, these projects are valid and good ideas. Also admitting where they are not yet delivering 100%, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the, the, the rationality of this. So there's an intuitive grasp. A lot of people are drawn to it, and they find it beautiful. But then you get kind of hammered by, by people who find it strange, or find it willful, or fi will, mm. will find it um, 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 meaningless. Yeah. And, and so you need to understand where the meaning is and to bring it back into uh, social conditions, mm -hmm. uh, the complexity conditions of contemporary city, contemporary life. The rationality. And the easier one is the engineering rationalities, mm -hmm. uh, but um, and that that these things become feasible. But to argue and, and, and explain why we should make these efforts in the first place is is what um, what this uh, eloquence tries to deliver. So it tries to defend and guide the project. So uh, I hope it doesn't come across as as as, as showy or or as as. Um, um, uh, wanting to be super smart or something. This mm -hmm. is really uh, important because otherwise these projects become very vulnerable. Yeah. Um, no, it has a structure, doesn't it? To and be, a to, 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 uh, exactly. It needs, mm -hmm. to be, it needs to be defended in the open mm -hmm. court of public opinion as well. Mm -hmm. First in the discipline. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think there was a lot of, um, the last 10 years was quite embattled because there's a lot of other retro waves coming in yeah. and a lot of hostility and rejection uh, of something which needed a bit more tolerance, it's easy to, to criticize uh, mm -hmm. something which is in gestation, but if, if you can articulate the put rationality potentials, mm -hmm. uh, that's very important mm -hmm. um, um, to, to defend the project and br bring in, bring in uh, new uh, generations to, to, to help, because this can only, it's very yeah. complex and difficult, this can only be done, uh, become a collective, nearly of the, a large part of the discipline, mm -hmm. not in isolated little groups. Mm. And that's why we need rhetoric, <laughs> or yes. let's say, or d manifesto style um, um, dissemination of, of the ideas to... to, to well, it's very compelling. Um, nice. I'm aware that you might all get fired, but did anyone have a really quick question <laughs> they want to Sorry. ask while we have Patrick locked in this slightly less beautifully articulated <laughs> seminar space? Yeah, a silly one, maybe. A silly one, yeah. 
some of the uh, of the models you showed us are uh, like uh, form finding uh, methods based on optimization, topological optimization, compressed uh, structures, relaxation dynamic, yeah. or like tensile uh, fabric. These are all like made out of models based on hypotheses on assumptions. And is um, artificial intelligence something you will explore to dig on areas which we don't have models and where we may be surprised by other ways of looking for innovation? Yeah, that, well, this is a huge field. I mean, yes, I'm very excited about this. We're, this is one thing we're very interested in. And to some extent, so, so what, what's the first bit in this direction is evolutionary algorithms. And to some extent, topology optimization is moving in this direction where, where it's where it's finding patterns uh, which are not necessarily um, preconceived in their topology and ontology. So that's the first glimpse of that. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. And you're right, there's a limitation in, in, if you have, uh, in, in, these, in the other techniques that you have some kind of an, a, an a priori ontology, which you then kind of, within which you then kind of find subsidiary solutions. So something more open than that through, through AI process. I'm very excited. Thank you. Any other quick questions, or is everyone feeling that they need to get back to their <laughs> desks? Having, having spent a wonderful Monday lunchtime. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll just um, say a really huge thank you to Patrick. Also, very quickly to Henry Lewis, actually. I wanted to thank him for the great exhibition upstairs, which I hope you'll all take time to go and look at now. But a really big thank you to Patrick for joining us today. So Thanks thank so much.